Thank you. Good evening and welcome to q and I'm Tony Jones and here to answer your questions tonight. Senate President Scott Ryan, human rights lawyer Diana Sayed, Professor of Strategic Studies at ANU, Hugh White, Shadow Foreign Affairs Minister Penny Wong and Executive Director of the Centre for Independent Studies, Tom Switzer. Please welcome our panel. Thank you very much. Q&A is live in Eastern Australia on ABC TV, iView and News Radio. Well, our first question comes from Chris Breen. Hugh White, you suggest in your book that Australia must start arming ourselves with nuclear weapons. In light of the recent Cuban Missile Crisis style standoff between the US and North Korea because of this very reason, what makes you think that our instigation of a nuclear arsenal won't have a similar effect? Well, it's a really good question. Just to be clear, I don't actually argue that Australia should acquire nuclear weapons. What I argue is that Australia's decision about nuclear weapons, the one we made 50 years ago when we decided that we weren't going to develop them ourselves, uh, was made in circumstances very different from the circumstances of today and even more distant from the circumstances we're going to live in, I would say, 20 or 30 or 40 years from now. And the biggest difference is that I think Asia is going to be more contested and more dangerous and America is going to be less reliable as an ally. So at the moment, we depend on US nuclear weapons to, de to deter any possible nuclear attack on Australia. The less confident we are of that, the less confident we are that we can rely on America to do that, the stronger the arguments for Australia to acquire Just, just briefly, why are you less confident of that and why would Australia need its own sabre to rattle if the US still has a nuclear umbrella, as they call it? Well, I'm less confident of America's place in Asia primarily because of a fundamental shift in the distribution of wealth and power. America has been the dominant power in Asia for decades, as long as any of us can remember, primarily because it's been the world's strongest power, the world's biggest economy and so on. As China grows, China's wealth challenges America's position and its ambitions to be the leading power in Asia challenge America's capacity to sustain that position. Now, I, it's not Donald Trump. Um, it's not the sort of toing and froing in, in US domestic politics year by year. It's the long-term shift in wealth and power and the rise of China and its ambitions to become the leading power in Asia, which makes it seem to me very unlikely that America will be able to sustain that dominant okay, position, just before, particularly looking long, if far into the distance. All right, but so before I pass on to the other panellists, and, and we'll come back to you as well, uh, at what point would China's military power, which seems now primarily defensive, pose a direct threat to Australia such that Australia <coughs> would need nuclear weapons? Uh, we don't know. But what we do know is that the factors which have made it so unlikely that China, or for that matter, any other major power in Asia, might threaten Australia, the things that have made Australia so secure from that kind of threat in the last few decades, are going to be less true in future. We don't know how much less true, but the choices we have to make today are ones which encompass the possibility, I think the quite significant possibility, that Australia will face both better armed and potentially more aggressive major powers in the region. An existential threat? Well, <coughs> at least a very, very serious threat and one which um, we can no longer rely on America to defend us from. You know, the fundamental shift is that for 50 years we've been able to depend on America to prevent a major power threatening Australia and to defend us if that happens. And uh, the, 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 the further ahead we look into the future, the less confident we can be of that. And we have to look a long way into the future when we talk about developing our defence forces. OK, we, we're going to explore this a little more with you. Uh, Penny Wong, um, is it time for Australia to have a debate about whether we need our own nuclear weapons capacity, as is being suggested here? Oh, well, well, on this, I, I don't agree with you, uh, insofar as he is actually saying that, and I take his point. Um, I, I think that Australia faces... Uh, a far more complex and wide-ranging set of circumstances than simply focusing on, you know, a potential attack on our territory. But I think what Hugh is grappling with is actually the right thing to grapple with, which is how do we deal with the most challenging set of external circumstances since World War II? How do we deal with the disruption we see globally and in our region? How do we deal with um, the fact that the two most important nations to us, you know, our friend and ally, the US, uh, and China are in different ways uh, making decisions and acting in ways which challenge the status quo. Now, you know, that's a very short summary of a much more complex discussion and I think what Hugh is seeking to do is grapple with it. Uh, I think we do need, uh, as a nation, to very focus very clearly on what we want in our region and how, what can we do to achieve uh, sustaining 
the, the sort of region we want. Can you, and I can think you, part, can, of that, uh, part of that we'll has come to back be to, deep uh, engagement. We're going to talk oh, more to... about the general thing, but what about this strategic issue about whether or not we could ever acquire or develop nuclear weapons in this country, whether a government would ever condone that? Well, I, I think in many ways it's the wrong question because I don't actually think getting into an arms race with China is, is a sensible proposition. What we do want is a multipolar region in which the US stays deeply engaged uh, and, and, and that is in Australia's interest. Tom Switzer. Well, I think that Hugh's thesis is premised on the observation that the United States is in serious decline in East Asia. Uh, but to paraphrase Mark Twain, I think reports of America's retreat from the region are grossly exaggerated. Um, Hugh and I, and I think Penny as well, would agree that America's made some very bad decisions in the post 9-11 era, most notably the invasion of Iraq, which did cost America dearly in prestige and credibility and power and influence to some extent. But nevertheless, I think across Asia, whether it's India, Japan, Vietnam, Singapore, there's a well-founded conviction uh, that America, even under a Donald Trump or a Bernie Sanders, which can't be ruled out in 2020, uh, America will still be the predominant power on military, energy, uh, self-sufficiency, education, innovation, and demographic trends. Whereas China, uh, as the saying goes, uh, will grow old before it grows rich. So I have more confidence in American staying power than Hugh does. I'll, I'll just quickly come back to Hugh to respond to that briefly, if, if you can. Yes, uh, look, uh, America is an extraordinarily, will remain an extraordinarily powerful country with, with huge assets. But our own Treasury in the, in the government's foreign policy white paper in 2017 predicted that by 2030, China's economy will be $42 trillion and America's will be 24, 42 to 24. The fact is that America won't remain the, 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 the most powerful country in the world. It won't remain the primary power in Asia. It's just wishful thinking for us to keep on thinking that what's worked so well for us in the past will keep working indefinitely in the future. And it's the implications of that really radical shift in Australia's international setting, which is what I'm trying to grapple with. I'm going to try just quickly bring us back to the nuclear weapons yes. issue, since yep. you've sponsored this debate effectively. <laughs> Let's imagine a future in which Australia did have nuclear weapons. What would the targets be? Well, it's a really important question. Let me just make one point clear. I, I think all the arguments, including the arguments from the question, all the arguments against Australia getting nuclear weapons are, are really strong, have always been strong, remain strong. But the arguments in favour of us getting them are stronger because the reliance we can place on others is less. What would we want them to do? There's only one thing Australia would want nu nuclear weapons to do, and that is to deter a nuclear threat from others. The idea that we'd use nuclear weapons to fight a war, I think, is just bad strategy and bad morality. But the one They'd thing... have to be pointed at something, though. Oh, oh, yeah. oh yes. And, no, and no, generally no. speaking, what nuclear weapons are pointed at is cities. Yeah, that, well, the, the nuclear weapons that would make sense for Australia to acquire would be aimed at cities. They would be aimed to impose uh, massive damage on an adversary to deter them from using their nuclear weapons against us. And that's the only purpose which they've been used. So it would be a, what's called in the trade a minimum deterrent strategy. But, it's, but as I spell out in the book, it's a pretty grim idea. And meanwhile, how would our close neighbour Indonesia respond? Surely this would ignite Indonesia. Indonesian nationalism, which is highly in the Australian uh, national uh, interest. It, it, yes, it, it, not, it, it, not to mention Indonesia acquiring its own nuclear weapons. Of course, weapon. well, of course. I mean, and which is the logic behind non-proliferation, isn't it? I yes. mean, whatever yeah. one's views about nuclear weapons to date, yeah. the international community has said, and obviously yeah. North yeah. Korea is an exception to that. Okay, I'm going to have to shift it to yeah, the other side is, of the panel to hear well what. <laughs> enough, because you know, the, so the Deanna, I'll start with you. Yeah. Because of no, more nuclear weapons. Sorry, oh, we'll come okay. back to you, Penny. Sorry, I was just finishing my sentence. Okay, um, I just, I, I just think that this is the fact that we're even having this conversation about Australia becoming nuclear is just astonishing to me. Um, and I just, nuclear weapons are the most inhumane and indiscriminate weapons that we have to date um, on this planet. And it causes such severe internet environmental damage. It undermines national and global security. It directs vast public resources away from human needs. And this whole non-proliferation um, ban treaty that um, you know Australia has been spearheading with ICANN, the International Campaign Against Nuclear Weapons, and have done a phenomenal job of getting 122 countries on board to sign this. Um, I just, as what you've mentioned previous, it would it would actually. Um, you know, trigger a nuclear arms race in our region, particularly our closest ally in Indonesia. And the, the dangers of having a nuclear weapon are 
arise from their very existence. So the fact that Australia would even be entertaining this thought is unfathomable and unconscionable um, to me, and it goes against everything in international law. OK, it's not that we've never had the debate before, and before I come to uh, Scott Ryan, I'll go to the next question because it'll go to him, uh, from Bo Pung. Um, so in the late 1960s, Prime Minister John Horton um, pressed for de developing a domestic nuclear weapon option. However, this effort failed, failed to result in any substantive result due to the lack of uh, bureaucratic support. Um, the effort ended in 1973 with, Australia, with Australia's ratification of the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. What is the current prevalent bureaucratic stance in Australia? So, Scott, I'll go with you because I think the last Prime Minister, John Gorton, as was just said, uh, in '68 was the last Prime Minister to actively uh, think it was a good idea for Australia to have nuclear weapons of its own. Well, we've, over at least my lifetime, I was born after that, have historically viewed non-proliferation um, and the alliance with the US as a com combined way to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons, uh, the risk that poses, particularly with, with rogue states. Uh, and the alliance with the US, uh, and obviously they being a nuclear power as core to our security interests. I think one of the things Hugh highlights, and I haven't read the entire book yet, I apologise to Hugh earlier, it only came out last week, is that unlike that era, um, we are now in the front line of this strategic competition. Um, in that era, Europe was really the front line of strategic competition, uh, albeit there was a great deal of activity, of course, in our region. Now, the nation we are looking at to our north, the growing power economically and militarily being China, is, of course, the focus of this. So we're in a very different position. I am not as pessimistic as Hugh. Um, I don't criticise him at all for raising it. That is the job of people like Hugh, um, to float ideas and to challenge current thinking. But our values underpin a relationship with the US. Values and interests underpin an alliance. Uh, the key test I think Hugh talks about is resources. What is the capacity in relative terms of us and the United States in our region? That balance is obviously changing. I, however, am slightly more optimistic, like Tom, about the capacity of the US demographically, uh, economically, technologically, um, to maintain its lead, even if the relativity is slightly changed. And I cannot see a time uh, where we might talk about issues much further away from Australia later tonight, where US interests aren't going to be directly impacted by activities in our immediate region. And that will underpin um, the ongoing involvement they have. Let's go, let's go uh, sorry, Diana, just for one second. Um, let's just go quickly back to what happened in 68. Uh, Dean Rusk, the Secretary of State, came to visit John Gorton uh, to, to try and get him to sign up to the non-proliferation, nuclear non-proliferation treaty. And Gorton said, I can't trust America um, to defend us against a nuclear threat. So I don't want to sign that treaty. I want the ability to build our own nuclear weapons. His scientists said to him, you, we can do that very quickly. We only learnt this because those State Department cables were leaked a few years ago. Could you ever imagine that argument happening again? Um, because Hugh is saying uh, that the United States may not be trustworthy as allies. Look, I, as I said before, I think interests as well as relationships and values underpin alliances. And I can't see a time where the US is not going to have direct, very important interests in our region, uh, particularly even around shipping lanes, let alone our ongoing military cooperation, let, a, let alone the fact they are our largest foreign investor. There's commercial interests as well. I think the relationship we have with them, we've got to be careful not to just view through a military or ANZUS prism. Um, now, I don't know if those conversations will happen again, and if, they, if, if I did know they would happen, I probably wouldn't talk about them on television. Um, so um, I can't imagine that discussion happening again in those terms, and, you know, that happened nearly 50 years ago. Uh, Deanna, sorry, I interrupted you before. No, I was just really curious to know, like, if there is a shift in prominence and of the US to China and there's going to be this Asia pivot, I'm just curious to know why we have to talk about it through a nuclear armament lens. Why can't we critically engage with China on other fronts? We do it already through trade and other multilateral fora and influence that way. What has China done to show any signs of aggression? There's no ideological agenda there that we really have anything to fear from China. And being a nuclear deterrent state, to me, is still not justifiable. And let me put that straight back to Hugh. I mean, you're a strategic yeah. analyst, so your, your 
th plan really is to look forward yeah. sometime in the future and predict what China will be uh, and how we should respond going forward. So what is it that you see yeah. that yeah. causes you to yeah. think we're going to need nuclear weapons? Yeah. Well, and just to be clear, I'm not sure myself that we do need nuclear weapons. I think that the, 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 the probabilities are changing. But I just want to go back to a point... I'm not sure that nuance is worth it. Yeah. <laughs> well, but, it's, but it's, actually, it's actually a very important one. You know, the difference between saying we need these things and, and saying we need to debate them. Look, I want to go back to the only question. But I, I share your view. I, I mean, this is the hardest issue I've ever dealt with in 40 years of thinking about the unpleasant business of war. And I really find myself... I say in the book, I find it appalling that Australia might confront this situation. But the, the situation where might, we might find ourselves making what would seem to me to be in many ways a tragic decision. The reason why I think we might, and this goes to your point, is that we don't know what kind of country China will be 30 or 40 years from now. And I just have to stress 30 or 40 years is the time frame we have to think about. And not just China. We don't know what India will be 30 or 40 years from now. And so the choice we make today and the choices we make in future about both our conventional forces and our nuclear forces have to acknowledge that maybe it'll all go well. Maybe China will become an extraordinarily powerful state, probably the dominant power in the Western Pacific, but it will use its power in a moderate, kind, gentle kind of way. And, and if so, we're, we're in good shape. Just, but just, if uh, not, just, then sorry. our failure to make that decision soon will will put us in a much more dangerous position. And it's that sort of tragic dilemma that we have to deal with. Just a quick question, because um, we've seen Iran um, trying to go through the process yes, of, yeah. of building a nuclear yeah. capacity, then stopping and pausing and yeah. now maybe moving in that direction. We don't know. Yeah. Uh, could Australia or does Australia have the technical capability to build nuclear weapons now? Uh, Gorton was told uh, yes. it could happen very quickly. Yes, we're probably not as well placed as we were in Gorton's day because Australia had a stronger nuclear industry then than we do now. Um, the opinions differ on that. Um, some people tell me that we could actually move quite fast within a few years. Uh, some people say it would be longer. From my point of view, the, the hardest thing is not actually building the weapons but building the delivery systems. And the weapon by itself, of course, is only part of the, um, part of the picture. And just to confirm what it is you're suggesting might be needed. You're talking about ballistic missiles based in Australia or on submarines. I mean, what kind of uh, capability I, are you talking about? I, I, I'm... Uh, just to go back to it, I find it kind of distasteful, actually, to get into this business, but, but I do... Once you the start book, the debate... But I do in the book, exactly. <laughs> no, exactly. And, and it's also appropriate, because you don't want this to be a kind of a, a fact-free uh, conversation. I think the only kind of military... Of nuclear capability that would make sense for Australia would be, would be that the... the the same kind of posture that, for example, Britain and France has, which is ballistic uh, uh, missiles based on submarines, because they're so secure, they're so hard to target. OK, I'm going to move on to the next question from Louise Claridge. It's a broader question that's still in this general area. Louise. Is it possible for Australia to maintain its primary security relationship with the US whilst still maintaining our strongest economic relations to China? Will the Trump presidency and growing US Sino tensions force Australians' hand to recalibrate our geopolitical foundations? Tom Switzer. Well, I certainly agree uh, that the, uh, this is a, a very delicate balancing act and it's become more delicate over the last few years trying to reconcile our most important trade partner, China, and our most important security alliance, the United States. And in a way, history has not really prepared us very well for this because for the first half of the 20th century, and even before that, when we were a collection of colonies far removed from the Western world, our political class, the public at large, <coughs> took refuge in having a very close security relationship with what Menzies called a great and powerful friend. And that, of course, was Great Britain. Then after World War II and the onset of the Cold War, and then the Suez Crisis in 56, uh, that great power became the United States. I think the US alliance will remain the centrepiece of our foreign policy um, because, uh, among other things, the United States pr provides so much top quality uh, defence equipment, such as the Growlers and the Joint Strike Fighters. It's also got a very important investment relationship with Australia. But our alliance will change, and it will change because of the rise of China. 
It's difficult. We've never been in this position before. It's like riding two horses simultaneously at the same... <laughs> I've said this before, but the difficulty now is that those two horses are going further and further apart, so it requires new diplomatic skills, more agility, more nuance, not necessarily giving unconditional and unqualified support to Uncle Sam, and uh, take a leaf out of Lord Palmerston's uh, dictum, uh, the great Victorian... British Foreign Secretary of the 19th century, he said that a nation has no permanent enemies or eternal allies. Our interests are permanent and eternal. Uh, Penny Wong, uh, I said we'd get back to this. And yeah, I think the two things that Tom just said, which I think are worth repeating, um, and I agree with. History hasn't prepared us well for it. I think that's true. Um, I, I think I, just, I, I use the phrase, you know, the playbook of the past decades is of limited utility, but he probably said it more succinctly than I. Um, I agree also that the US alliance will remain you know, a key pillar of our foreign policy, uh, our key security relationship, uh, and it is a relationship of interests and values. But it is the case that we uh, are living in a time where the two relationships you described uh, are with powers, both of whom are making choices which are changing the status quo. Mm. Uh, and I think what this, uh, it is, it, what, what this era will require from Australia is frankly more from us. Think that we greater Australian agency required, both in terms of the sort of region we want and the work we do with regional partners to that purpose, the work we do in the alliance, as well as the work in our bilateral relationship. And I think there is a much greater weight on us uh, to assert and prosecute our interests at this time. And, and that is a, a different world, for, frankly, for Australian foreign policy and Australian strategic policy to, to, to a great extent. You want, you've pointed out that both um, Germany and Japan are recalibrating their relations with the United States and reconsidering the natures of the alliance. Oddly enough, both um, uh, have started debates on getting nuclear weapons as well. Um, do you see that we're in the same boat as they are? Uh, yes, yes, I do, but I think in some ways our position is even more acute because it goes back to something that... Uh, um, both Penny and Tom have mentioned, and that is this is new for Australia. Ever since European settlement, we have had either Britain or America as our guardians. We have never confronted a future in Asia without having a great and powerful friend to make Asia safe for us. And I think even an, on their more optimistic view of America's future role, I think they'd agree, putting words in their mouth, that, that it's, it's at least going to be more complex for America to get its way and to help its mates in Asia than it has been hitherto. I mean, I, I think the key thing for us in, in squaring the circle between Britain, uh, between uh, America and China is that it's not entirely up to us. Penny's right, A our agency is important, but how difficult it is for us to ride those two horses depends on them, depends on America and China. The more intensely they see one another as rivals, the more they will each expect Australia to side with them against the other and I think that's exactly what's happening at the moment as their rivalry has intensified over the last few years uh, the, the, and, I, and I will I expect continue to intensify over the next few years Australia will face tougher and tougher choices and there will come a point perhaps and you know this is a gloomy prospect I'm not one of those who for a moment thinks that war between the US and China is inevitable but the kind of contest that's now underway between America and China as to which of them will be the dominant power in the world's most dynamic region, and that is what's going on right now. And, Hugh, and Hugh, let's not discount the fact that there are significant voices in Washington and in the broader American academic community, such as Professor John Mearsheimer, who will be debating you in a few weeks' time. That's right. Here in, here in Canberra. And they make the point that it's inevitable that uh, US allies like Australia will support a containment strategy that, that, against China. That's, that's right. And the question for us is, are, are we willing to support the United States in trying to contain China's rise? Because let, people let, in let Washington me, expect us to. Let me move that's across it. the other side of the panel. Scott, um, what do you think? And um, has Donald Trump complicated this picture and could it change after the next election? The strategic rivalry between China and the US is multiple, has multiple facets. I mean, we're seeing, for example, the, the trade and economic phase, particularly at the moment, um, uh, with the dis debates and ongoing issues with the WTO and the US role and China role there. Uh, what Hugh talks about is the longer term strategic role. Um, 
I agree with Tom and, and Penny and Hugh on this. This is a challenge for foreign policy here. We are going to have to balance our competing needs. We have an interest in maintaining strong economic links. We also have an interest in maintaining a strong, our strong security links with the US and a strong US role as a protector of um, the, the, the order we have in the region. But there's also other nations cha changing profoundly in the region. I mean, Indonesia is going through enormous growth. I mean, it's still a very young country, unlike China, which is actually ageing, as Tom mentioned. Um, Japan is going through a different phase. When I look at the, the, the trade-based conflict between China and the US, for example, um, I, I do remember in the 80s that happening with Japan, albeit at a lower level. But there was huge angst in the United States about Japanese trade policy and the impact upon the American economy, particularly in manufacturing in the 80s. We managed to get past that, um, but it was, of course, without what I might call the, the cultural and ideological competition or broader strategic competition. This is going to take nuance. Now, I actually have faith that Australia can do that. Um, I have a lot of faith in our officials. Um, the fact that we're here on a program like this, and Hugh brought out a book raising such challenging ideas as he did last week, and we're talking about it, is, I think, a sign of the maturity of, it, of the way we as a country can discuss this. Mm, I wonder if China considers it mature to be talking about nuclear weapons aimed at Beijing. Because uh, they see things very differently, obviously. Uh, but I think China's also very realistic to know that there are right. people like you in Australia and other people who think about the long-term strategic aims. It's, you know, we're not naive, and I don't think they are either. Okay. But let, let's yeah. just, sorry, just quickly, just remember there are very real weaknesses and limitations in China. I mean, even if they sort out their demographic <laughs> challenges, they still face problems like debt, uh, cor corruption, um, you know, pervasive uh, air and water pollution. Uh, Richard Sharma from Morgan Stanley, someone whose judgment I respect immensely, um, he, he calculates in his award-winning book, The Rise and Fall of Nations, that between 2000, when China became part of the WTO, and 2014, 90,000 millionaires left mainland China for greener pastures, and a lot of them came to Australia and New Zealand and North America. So that tells you that if those trends continue, China will have a lot of internal challenges to deal with. OK, look, I'm going to go to another global threat because we'll run out of time if we keep talking about the one issue. Uh, the next question is from Cynthia Mifsud. The US, as recently as last week, were willing to start airstrikes on Iran. There appeared two triggers. One, an unmanned drone shot down, and two, allegations that Iran had struck oil tankers. At the same time, reports that Iran were either breaching or planning to breach its 2015 agreement in regards to enriching uranium also arose. This, of course, following the US's withdrawal from the Iran nuclear deal, which was working the way it was supposed to. Are we heading for war? Diana, I'll start with you. Yeah, and thank you for your question. I just want to premise it with the drone strikes. It's alleged. We don't know for sure if that, this is what's happened, this is what the media is reporting on. And I really want to focus in on that. Um, and I want to make it really clear to the audience that Iran does not have any nuclear weapons, nor has it indicated any intention to acquire nuclear weapons, nor does it have any uranium-grade weapons. Um, we actually have to be really careful at this time because we cannot make the same mistake that we did in 2003 under this false pretext um, of we weapons of mass destruction that we did in Iraq and the disastrous war that ensued from there. So I have to want to be really clear um, about that um, because we don't want another Iraq 2.0. And it seems that the playbook that's um, playing out in the media um, with the tweets now back and forth between Donald Trump um, and the Iranian um, government um, is really problematic and it's a dangerous game. And yeah, we could be headed very likely towards war given the, that the US um, withdrew from the nuclear deal only last year and then the crippling sanctions that they've put on the Iranian people at the moment um, is really devastating. Um, and it's a really troubling and dangerous time. Scott Ryan, um, what do you think about that? And bear in mind that uh, the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, asked about this, uh, or asked that if there were any US request uh, for uh, Australian military assistance in some kind of conflict um, in Iran, it would be considered seriously and on its merits. Um, can we take that at all to be a kind of affirmative um, suggestion that Australia might be willing to get involved in another conflict well, in the Gulf? Well, I believe he also said that there'd been no such, such request. request. Mm. Um, look, I think we've got to start... He didn't the say there'd been no conversations. Um, no, but um, he, he did say, I think, there'd been no request. Mm. Um, I think we have to start from the premise of a few things. Iran is not a normal international actor. 
Um, Iran is a, a, a state that sponsors terrorism. Um, now, I'm not having a go at the Iranian people, but this is not a normal international actor like one in our region where we might have a difference of opinion with. Um, it would be a very bad thing not only for the region but for the world for Iran to be able to not only have nuclear weapons but to, or to be able to scale up quickly to be able to get them, whether that be um, enrich more quickly or have a delivery mechanism more quickly. It would spark an incredible amount of tension in a very, very volatile region, let alone the global economic impact of a, of a potential closure of um, oil supplies out of the Persian Gulf. So I don't think we're dealing with this in the way we can deal with this in the way we might deal with a normal international, um, a challenging international situation. But should we deal with it, um, taking Diana's point, should we deal with it in the same way that we dealt with the progress towards war in Iraq, where fraudulent information or intelligence led the United States and inevitably Australia into a conflict? Well, I don't, I mean, I don't see anything like that on the cards. And with all due respect to the cri criticism, there was a lot of debate at the time. Uh, but even people who are were after the fact critical of the events in Iraq, well before my time in public life, um, there was general or more widespread agreement about the quality of the intelligence at the time, that there were weapons, that there was a risk of weapons of mass destruction at the time, even if people who disagreed with the actions the Americans took. Yeah, there was a strong yeah. belief among some that the intelligence was real, but it turned out it wasn't. Absolutely. And, and, and as I, a I, result, I, there was a massive yeah. war and hundreds of thousands and of people I'm, died. 600,000 people and actually, and more point, internally displaced. And no. what I'm saying is what we've got now with Iran is a state that does sponsor terrorism, uh, that if it got a nuclear capacity or the ability to get one quickly would probably provoke an arms race in a very volatile region which no one wants to see. So preventing that happen is a, quite frankly, a global good. I'm not proposing or supporting any action. I'm just saying that I don't think we can deal with this through the prism of dealing with a, a normal set of circumstances. OK, Penny Wong. And the well, question was, are we headed for a war? Well, um, a military conflict and escalation are in no one's interests. Uh, and Absolutely. I note, I note um, that the Prime Minister has said that no such request has been made. Um, I do agree that a nuclear capable Iran is a frightening prospect. Uh, that is why we and the government uh, supported what's known as the JCPOA, so the nuclear deal, as a means of averting the development of that capability. Uh, we were disappointed with the US decision to pull out of it. We expressed that publicly, as did, I think, Ms Bishop at the time. Uh, and we would urge the existing partners to the agreement, uh, given the events of the last couple of weeks, including the, the uh, additional, I think, news story tonight about enrichment, uh, it, it urge them to utilise the dispute mechanisms within the agreement. If um, there were a request, would Labor, on principle, reject it <laughs> well, or oppose it? It's a hypothetical. Uh, no such request has been made. The point I have made, though, is that I think um, we have a, a fair degree of history uh, to look at about this region, uh, and uh, I, I don't think uh, military escalation is in anybody's interest or in the mm. regions or the, the, in the interests of global stability. Uh, and, you know, that... that, that um, so you're saying it's just too early for I, Labor to I, come to a in principle well, decision? Well, there's, there's been no request made of Australia. Hmm. And I think, that, I think one of the, the issues that was raised was and we, uh, we, we do have, as I understand it, uh, some uh, assets in the Gulf which are part of a, a range of maritime operations, I think, around um, uh, you know, countering um, criminal syndicates, etc. Et I think it's one thing to talk about what those might be engaged in, um, in terms of civilian ships. It's a, it's a very, it's a, another thing to talk about, um, military conflict. Tom Switzer, um, there's one thing we know, um, Trump actually used a, a tweet uh, to talk about the potential obliteration of parts of Iran um, if this were to escalate. And we do know that among his key advisers, there are people like John Bolton, who have in the past recommended military strikes against Iranian nuclear facilities. Um, how seriously uh, do you think this is going to end up? Well, bear in mind, Trump won the 2016 election in part on a campaign to, you know, make America great again, but also be a less interventionist mm. foreign policy. I mean, he portrayed Hillary Clinton as the more hawkish candidate. Mm. And he did this for understandable reasons. I mean, the American people are tired of mm. the world. They're suffering from foreign policy fatigue. 
And all the available polling evidence indicates that there's no hankering for support in, the, in middle, middle America or middle Australia for yet another war mm. in the Persian Gulf in the Middle East. I mean, I think Trump's decision to pull out of the Iranian nuclear deal from 2015 was a grave mistake because it now means the Iranians can pull out, which they've just done, they're now enriching uranium, and they are now bent on becoming a nuclear power. Uh, you think about that. My advice to the President, for what it's worth, would, is, is to adopt a more balance of power strategy and talk to the Iranians as well as the Saudis and try to play off the Iranian Shia bloc against the Saudi Sunni bloc, create a balance of power so no one power dominates the region. And then, meanwhile, if they don't do that, Trump will have to deal with a nuclear Iran. And what will he do then? He'll have to contain and deter it not conduct a preemptive strike, which will just lead to all sorts of unintended consequences, the likes of which we saw in 2003. And if a key ally like Israel conducted those strikes, um, would America support it? Would they do anything about it? Would Israel take preemptive action? I think the Americans probably would support it, and I think Trump's got himself in a bind here. Um, but if he's true to his instincts, I don't think that he would support this strike. Remember, he pulled back when virtually all his senior advisers thought he'd go through with it. You what? Well, I think the first thing to remember is that the reason we're in this situation at all is that there are no credible, um, brief, quick, easy military options to deprive Iran of its nuclear program. If there were, they'd have been used by now. Hmm. And so, you know, the first question you've always got to ask when you're talking about armed forces, or well, at least one of the first questions is, is this going to work to achieve our objectives? And so far as I can see, the idea that you'd start a bombing campaign, for example, against Iran, to, to deprive it of its nuclear facilities simply would not work. They're too dispersed, they're too well protected and many of them are too well hidden. And so you bomb away for a week and you've still got the same problem except a much more angry and hostile Iran even than you're dealing with at the moment. The alternative is a full-scale invasion. And when you ask, are we heading for war? And we all do think, of course, about 2003. It's worth making the point that that would... Remember how big Iran or Iraq was? Well, Iran is twice as big and four times as hard to invade because it's eight times as unified. And it would just be an immense undertaking. I don't think the United States has the resources to do it and it wouldn't get any allies. And it would also, remember, take six months, maybe nine months, maybe a year to build up the forces. Never say never, but I think that is more or less unthinkable, partly for the point that Tom makes, that is, this is not Donald Trump's style of politics. He's a very... Strange character, but he does seem not to be that addicted to that particular style of There's an election of coming, of course, uh, next year, and uh, one of the fears is that uh, during a war, as happened yes. with George W. Bush, people tend to vote for the president. Oh, yes. Th th there are risks. I'm just really concerned that this whole conversation about Iran, no-one's really factored in, like, the people, yeah. the Iranian yeah. people. Like, we're talking about a population of over 80 million people who have a culture, mm. a history... They're, you know, very linked to <laughs> traditions in the region and, you know, we're not just talking about dehumanising them and, like, this has, like, repercussions for the whole region, mm. as Iraq did, as Afghanistan did, as what we're seeing with Syria now, Yemen, Libya. I can rattle off a, a litany. And this, this conversation doesn't exist in a vacuum. We're talking about people's lives here and intervention, regime change, nuclear armament, all of this conversation that we're talking about, like, these people's lives, they're not political pawns. And we don't want to... And, and a war with Iran wouldn't just be swift and over with um, in a couple of years. We're talking about long-term war here um, and it would have like devastating repercussions for the entire region um, from from Morocco to Pakistan um, and not to mention that you know um, they have allies very strong allies in Russia and China as well which we're not talking about or mentioning here they could activate their proxies around the region um, and this could have devastating fact this devastating um, effects for generations to come. But having said all this, let's it. not forget the fact that the Iranians are sponsoring these Shia militias all across the Persian Gulf. They've committed atrocious human rights abuses to mainly Sunni families, particularly yeah, but... in Iraq and Syria. Yeah, but Tom, don't don't disregard <clears throat> the fact that there's already a growing human rights movement within Iran. Like they are people with agency as well. <coughs> it's very easy for people here to talk about war as if it's an abstract concept. If you've had no proximity to it, you haven't been personally affected by it. It's very easy to sit in your think tanks and sit in your universities and just talk about it. Like this is real. I think Tony, we can all agree. Lives. We, 
hypotheticals are good for discussion. They're not good for decision. Yeah. Um, and, and they're very difficult in this circumstance. I think everyone can broadly agree that successful policy here means no violent conflict and no use of force. It's exactly. less than hypothetical, though, when the President of the United States says we could obliterate sections of your country if you don't do what we say. Not to mention the crippling yeah. sanctions um, on the country. Well, the, uh, actually, sanctions can be a very useful alternative to the use of force. And, in fact, I remember in the, when it came to the second Iraq conflict, you know, under George W. Bush, one of the arguments was sanctions should be used instead of force. So I don't think anyone's proposing that we actually completely wind back all the sanctions on Iran uh, because of the risk that this region has and of, and of this particular regime, which has dem been demonstrated. But just yeah, no I'm sorry, that. guys, I'm going to have to... Uh, Tom, just make your final point, we'll move on. Containment and deterrence can work. I mean, uh, it can't work against uh, terrorists who can run and hide, but rogue states like Iran, like Saddam's what Iraq, they, have, they well? have a mailing address and, and a return address, and if they ever use WMD, that would guarantee massive annihilation. OK, let's move on. Remember, if you hear any doubtful claims on Q&A, let us know on Twitter. Keep an eye on the RMIT ABC Fact Check and the Conversation website for the results. The next question, um, right down to parochial politics in Australia, comes from Russell Adams. In Julie Bishop and Christopher Pine's new appointments to business businesses whose major clients include Australian government agencies, many Australians see them as having significant potential conflicts of interest. Should a revised code of conduct for politicians include not only avoiding conflicts of interest in and out of office, but also being seen to be avoiding such conflicts? And should the arbiter for potential conflicts of interests be an independent third party rather than a parliamentary body? Penny Wong, start with you. Well, let's be clear about what the Ministerial Code of Conduct says first. It relevantly says two things. One is, after you've been a minister for 18 months, you can't lobby in your area. And the second thing it says is that you won't take personal advantage of information you've gained as a consequence of your ministerial office that isn't otherwise available to the general public. Uh, who is the current enforcer of the code? It's Mr Morrison. So I guess what I'd say to you is that um, there's no point in increasing um, the stringency of a ministerial code if the current code is not enforced. Uh, and it's ultimately a matter for the Prime Minister to decide how he is going to ensure that ministers, whether in office or after they leave office, comply with the code. Now, I know we, we raise concerns about this. The public raised concerns about both Mr Pine and Ms Bishop's appointment. They assert they're not breaching the code. That's actually not the test. Uh, it's not a subjective test. Um, <laughs> no, I didn't mean that to get a laugh, but anyway. <laughs> there you go. Um, and... Uh, I, I, I think it is incumbent upon the Prime Minister to explain to Australians, this is my code, I set it, I'm the Prime Minister, and this is how I'm going to ensure it's... Penny it Wong, isn't the problem here that these are guidelines um, no, and they're not laws, so there's no way of actually enforcing them? Well, nor is ministerial accountability to the Parliament. That's a Westminster Convention. I mean, this is... No, but you can sack ministers, but, but the you can't the prime... sack a non-minister who's retired. Sure, well, well, then the Prime Minister should say what other sanction he thinks is necessary. It is he, they are his standards mm. and he ought to enforce them. Uh, and I think reasonable questions have been raised about whether or not these two particular appointments comply with the two provisions that I outlined. OK, Scott Ryan, are you disturbed by this? Um, I'm more familiar with professional services firms so, than I am with the foreign aid component. With, so I'm more familiar with Christopher Pine's um, uh, position than I am with Julie Bishop's. It was certainly a very carelessly worded statement. I'll, I'll be honest. I mean, I, I don't think um, the, the, the statement helped in that sense. There's also the lobbying code of conduct, and the ministerial statement of standards does interact with that. And one of the things the lobbying code of conduct talks about is a very broad definition of what constitutes lobbying. Uh, and it also reinforces the ministerial statement by saying that applies here as well. So um, 
I think it's a good idea that the Prime Minister has directed the Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet, the most senior public servant in the country, to look at this. But I do make the point, this is a code of conduct and a statement of standards that actually predates the Coalition Government as well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been in place a very long time. Um, I think that... You we updated wait, it. We, we, uh, not this, the change they changed it, it quite a lot. <laughs> oh, no, they actually... The changes well, you're allowed to hold shares. The, 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 um, the changes weren't don't relate to anything to do with this. I believe the words are the same about this. That's true. Um, now, I think, let's wait and see what the Secretary of the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet says. I mean, community standards do evolve. Uh, let's wait to see what he says. It seems um, to be the community standards, that is to say, the pub test um, seems to be going in the other direction. Mm. Well, no, um, there I, seems to be yeah. a distrust of these politicians using their and, positions. And, and, and this is why I made the observation. I think the statements from a couple of the, couple of the organisations were particularly <coughs> carelessly worded. So, quickly, um, and you're, I the, think you're the President of the Senate. Yep. Um, your colleague, Tony Smith, is the uh, leader of the, is the Speaker yep. in the yep. House. Could you both um, take a stand here? and set rules to take away the permissions of these people to operate inside the parliament? Well, technically, yeah, all passes to parliament other than from MPs are granted by the presiding officers, um, but that's could, not... Could you decide not... that they're breaching the code... No, that, that would... That, I mean, it's not... It's, it's a government code. It's not a code of the parliament. There have been proposals, to, and I know some states have parliamentary ethics advisers. I make no observation on that, but that's one model that's been put up um, to actually allow people to ask questions and seek counsel as well as to have an enforcement mechanism. They haven't been supported by either houses of our parliament. So that's why I say, let's look at to see what um, the Secretary, <coughs> Prime Minister and Cabinet says. Um, they oversee the operation of this. Uh, they may have some recommendations, and we'll see where it goes from there. But I, I note that Penny also said that there's not been a breach of the code. I, I think part of this question goes to, has community standards evolved? Oh, well, I, I don't know if there has or not. I, I mean, I think that there are, on the face of it, it looks problematic, doesn't it? I said on the face of it, that it looks like a breach. I, what I said was they have asserted there's no oh, breach. Oh, my apologies. But that's I, not the test. I, I don't think... Um, I think this is a space where, and as a former Special Minister of State, I had to reform the expenses regime um, for members of Parliament. And I saw community standards evolve. And so there may be a space for that here, there may not be. So, Let's so, wait. Just, just uh, quickly, just to clarify that, are you saying that community standards may evolve to be more lenient? No, no, to be uh, more... I mean, no, they might, they might require tightening, as they okay. have in other, in, right. in other spaces. Okay. Sorry, that's what... All right, so um, I'm just going to leave that one with the politicians, because we've got quite a few questions. Oh, so this bloke makes a really good point, though. He reflects widespread concerns. Can I just make the point, too, that uh, Clyde... Uh, Christopher Pine entered Parliament in 93, Julie Bishop entered Parliament in 98, which means that they're entitled to a very generous parliamentary superannuation scheme, which was changed by Howard and Latham in 2004. So getting to your question, uh, they stand to make anywhere between two hundred and fifty and three hundred and fifty thousand dollars tax free for the rest of their lives. So it's not like they're they're, they're on Struggle Street. So why not just wait eighteen months before you use your insider influence to make a buck? But Tom, they're aspirational. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, there's a widespread con commu community view, and it's not just Penny. It's also Pauline Hanson and the Greens that reflect well, this view. All right, let's let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> that sentence is not often said. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let's move on. Uh, the next question is from Aisha Huck. As a Muslim youth, I feel as though the response to Israel Falau's extremist preaching would be vastly different if, rather than a Christian, he were a Muslim. If Israel Falau were a Muslim, would the Attorney General be considering new laws to protect religious freedoms? Uh, Diana, start with you. Yeah, thank you for that great question. Um, obviously, the topic of Flau's case in particular has gotten a lot of airtime lately, um, and I'm more interested in the discussion that's happening this week with interested groups and the consultation process that the Morrison government is going through with this Religious Discrimination Act. Um, I think that most of us would agree, and particularly as a Muslim woman myself, um, that you know we should people, anyone who chooses to practice or otherwise should be um, free to practice their religion, free from discrimination as well. Um, and particularly in light of the aftermath of Christchurch, having just gotten back from New Zealand myself, I think it's even more pertinent now than ever that we are protected um, from religious discrimination. Um, I just, you know, it's really important though that during this whole debate um, that's being sparked and we've had this conversation has been aired out, you know, every week, and particularly on this show as well. It's really important that these consultations and the process that's being undergone now, um, that the Act doesn't allow people or give them a licence to discriminate. Um, and having those conversations are really important to have because particularly 
um, communities that could be affected, the LGBTQI community and women as well, single mothers. So it's really important that this bill strikes a balance, that people who are free to practice their religion but are not granted a licence to discriminate. Uh, Scott, I'll just take you back to the question. Um, the questioner asks, would, would the, we still be having the same debate and the calls for a Religious Freedom Act if Israel Falau had been a Muslim? I'll be honest, I don't know. I mean, I think this debate's been brewing for a while. I think this debate follows a longer debate we've had about the laws around speech that have been, has been going on for several years. Now, I, I think this has got two issues. There's firstly the issue of what are you allowed to contract for and is the state allowed to interfere in the rights of contract? Then there is secondly laws around limiting of speech. Now, I've said before I am particularly radical and, and liberal on this. I'm much more down the American school of free speech in terms of, and that applies to defamation law, um, laws we have around vilification as well as laws we have about publication um, and freedom of the media. That's not a common view, I must say. But I think we've got to be careful whether we go down to what I say, trying to use the, the Elizabethan phrase of, of peering into people's souls. I don't know if something can be said or something that is said should be legal because of a particular religious view, whether that be being Christian, being Muslim or the writings of L. Ron Hubbard, that would otherwise be illegal if I didn't have a religion, if, if I wasn't being that. I don't like laws going to motive. I like laws looking at actions. And so I think the Attorney General is being very responsible here. I've had discussions with him. He understands the complexity and he's undertaken consultation within the parliamentary party before he takes it out to stakeholder groups. I just think we need to be careful, and I start from that point, that um, I don't think we need more laws limiting speech, uh, but at the same time, I, I think this is a complex balancing of competing interests that we've got to be careful we don't draft a broad law that then just kicks the ball into the judiciary or tribunals and we don't know where the answer is going to land. Penny Wong. OK. <clears throat> Can I, there are two points or two issues I want to address. First, in relation to Mr Falau. Um, can I say first, just at an emotional level, uh, I wish that we could have more expressions of love and forgiveness rather than condemnation when it came to belief. And I wish that public figures, politicians, sporting stars, etc., might consider for a moment, and I think I've been on this show saying this before, where their words land in vulnerable Australians mm. yeah. before they speak them. Uh, now, he is entitled to his beliefs. I disagree with them. And I think we ought to remember um, he doesn't speak for all Christians. Um, in terms of the broader issue, uh, we are an accepting, tolerant nation and we, we, we aspire to deal with each other respectfully. So whatever happens in this current debate around um, religious freedom, etc., I, I think we mustn't lose sight of those key characteristics of Australian identity. We don't want to become less accepting. We don't want to become less tolerant. We don't want to abrogate our agreed view that people are, are entitled to equality before the law, that we believe that people are equal regardless of gender, race, faith, sexuality, disability, etc. Uh, and we should hold I think, to, to, to those objectives, that we're not seeking to diminish that. Um, I'm, I'm open to a discussion about how we uh, deal with uh, religious protections. But I, I would make this point, and I made this point during the marriage equality debate. There is a, distinct, a distinction between a right to belief and the assertion uh, that that belief should lead to you being treated differently before the law. And that is a big thing to do. Mm. There are circumstances where Australia has done that. We have particular provisions, for example, in the Sex Discrimination Act, where because someone has a belief, they are not required to behave yeah. as other Australians are before the law. Um, but I think we need to think very carefully about how we manage um, <coughs> this debate. I hope it can be done in a way that's not partisan. I hope it can be done respectfully. And I hope it can be done with the objective of ensuring that just as Australians of faith don't wish to be discriminated against, that, Australian, that Australians of other attributes also don't wish to be discriminated uh, Just a quick against. one on this, because we may be about to see it. Uh, <laughs> religious freedom legislation. Um, uh, what would you be worried about? Well, I think I've just the principles I've just articulated. I, I don't. I want. I'm. I'm happy, and I think the the Labor Party is happy to engage constructively. What I don't want to see uh, is uh, the objectives 
um, that are a part of her, uh, Australian identity, tolerant, accepting nation the, in which people are treated equally, I don't want those abrogated. Mm. Um, okay. that's, um, that, that requires a, a very sensitive and respectful discussion. All right. Um, I'm going to move on because we've got a couple of other questions we really should be talking about. This first one is from Akriti Shori. Hello. So, over one million Uyghur Muslims are being held in internment camps in China at the moment, with new reports describing the forcible removal of children from their families. Considering that Australia has imposed autonomous sanctions on countries like Zimbabwe, Myanmar and Syria for human rights abuses in the past, do you think that there is more we can do to prevent further systemic violence against this ethnic minority? Or do our trade relations trump our moral conscience? I will start with our non-politicians. Tom. Well, I genuinely feel your pain. On my Radio National program, I've had a few segments dealing with the besieged Muslim population of northwest China. And it's not just a question for the government, it's also the media. How often do you see this issue raised on the front pages of newspapers? Mm. It's hardly raised, mm. I find. Mm. Uh, and it's quite extraordinary given the systematic repression of these poor souls in a brutal authoritarian regime. Now, with respect to your question, human rights is a very noble and powerful impulse, it, it, one that shouldn't be casually dismissed. Um, and for human rights activists like Diana, uh, they're a cause. But for governments, human rights are one of many interests that they have to take into account when they deliberate on foreign policy. Uh, such as stability, order, uh, prosperity, um, their moral values too. So in the course of making foreign policy, uh, governments will base their decisions according to the circumstances and no one in their right mind is suggesting that Australia uh, join some sort of economic embargo on China to punish them for the way they're treating the Muslim population. It's a tough, tough issue. Um, but this is one of the dilemmas, getting back to the original questions we were raising at the start of the show, about how we deal with uh, our largest trade partner. How tough can we be with it? Diana. I would suggest a lot tougher, Tom. Absolutely. Um, the one million Uyghur Muslims that are in re-education camps, um, akin to concentration camps, um, are having to renounce their faith, having to um, be arbitrarily detained, separated from their families. Um, some of them are it's amounting to torture, the way that they're being treated. Again, Muslims suffering in a neighbouring, in our region, and we're not saying anything really, we're remaining silent. Again, with Myanmar as well, with the Rohingya Muslims there, where Australia continued to aid and support um, and train the Myanmar military, where there was an ethnic cleansing campaign of Rohingya Muslims there. I mean, what is it gonna take for Australia to actually take a moral and principled stance on human rights? I get your point, Tom, but human rights underpins the stability of every nation. If they don't have that, then that, that country is not something that we should be engaging with. And we should be using all of the levers that we have to try and influence for positive change. Because how many more Uyghur Muslims, over one million now in China, how many more Rohingya Muslims need to be um, displaced from their homes? We're talking about people here again. Men, women and children being displaced from But their how homes. can we be effective and not just merely feel virtuous? What can we actually do to well, change let me the throw, Let me throw that question to Hugh because I want to hear from the other panellists as well. Go ahead. Uh, well, I think um, it, the, the, the question, you framed, framed the question exactly the right way. Um, on the one hand, we have a very deep and um, you know, passionate, really, uh, anxiety about what's happening, for example, to the Uyghurs. On the other hand, we have a relationship with China which just about defines our economic future. You know, if you, you ask the average Australian, what's our economic future? The answer is China. And one thing we can be pretty sure of is that decisive action by Australia on the Uyghur issue would have immense economic consequences for us. And that's, that, that's what these guys <laughs> do for a living. They strike that balance. And it, against a country like Zimbabwe, that doesn't matter much to us economically, mm -hmm. it's easy. Mm -hmm. Against a country like China, and I don't want to sort of trivialise this, but you know, our economic relationship with China relates to the economic well-being of just about everyone in this room, everyone watching. It's a, it is a huge issue. It's a terrible issue, actually. 
But I've got to say pessimistically, I think the chances that anything Australia would do would actually make any difference, no matter how radical our steps were, are very low. That doesn't end the moral conversation, but it's certainly part of the moral conversation. Yeah. Uh, it leaves me very gloomy about it. Penny Wong. <laughs> well, first, as a sort of overarching principle, your foreign policy should be an expression of your identity, your values and your interests. And, and it is a question of um, ascertaining what is the right path through all of those uh, propositions. Second, in relation to the Uyghurs, that has been raised. I, I can't speak for the government. I'll let Scott do it, but I, I certainly can say we have raised that publicly. We, um, the then leader of the opposition was asked questions about it, a particular speech he did, and he responded accordingly. We've asked questions in the parliament in Senate estimates about these issues uh, because we should ask those questions and they should be uh, made public. Um, what we do know and what our concerns are because the rule of law and human rights do matter. Uh, but I think there is a reasonable question about effectiveness. Uh, there are times where private discussions are uh, one judges to be the most effective way. There are times where public discussion is the most effective way. Uh, and the judgment about trade, I think, that you reference, I think Hugh is right. The reality is, uh, you know, it's a, an asymmetric relationship economically. So I'm not sure that that, that, those would, that would be an effective way of dealing with those issues. Scott Ryan. Well, in short, I agree with broadly what Hugh and Tom and Penny have said. I mean, we have to look at this through the prism of our values. We do have a human rights discussion with China. But in politics, you've also got to look at capacity. And the truth is that, um, as Penny described it as asymmetric, um, it, we would have very little impact upon China and an enormous impact upon Australia. So the effectiveness of any action we took would, would be virtually zero. Uh, and it, on that basis, you know, I, I don't necessarily I, I don't think we should be shy about being realistic that we can use economic sanctions where we know they work, but there's no point necessarily in inflicting great harm upon Australians if that would damage a relationship, prevent the conversations that are always ongoing around a range of issues, but also not have the desired effect the sanction is hoped to. Uh, what you've yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to give you the final word because we're nearly out of time, yeah. but you've heard the pragmatic arguments. Uh, yeah. Your response. <laughs> what you're essentially have all said on the panel here today is that Muslim lives don't matter. That's and that is right. exactly that's what it is. That's not fair. It's, that's what people are hearing well, at home, they're, they're hearing in the audience, and that is just so heartbreaking to hear that. And I'm just really disappointed because we have so many levers in the toolbox that we could be using to, to influence foreign policy. We could be using it at trade and it doesn't, human rights are not mutually exclusive to our values around trade. And it's really important that we try to engage critically with these nations and try to influence when these things are happening. And it's not just happening, um, you know, it's a mass scale ethnic cleansing campaign in Myanmar, re-education camps of over a million Uyghur Muslims in China at the moment. And this is the most disappointing result, I think, from the panel the tonight. The discussion we had is not worthy of that bumper sticker, quite frankly. No, I don't I'm really think. disappointed. Yeah. That's yeah, my and opinion. And in, fact, and, and in fact, Australia on the Rohingya issue, or has on a bipartisan basis been quite active internationally. Still training so, well, and look, the military so haven't I, cut I just, military aid. Yeah, I, I understand your point, but I, I, don't think it's, I, don't, I don't think it was a, a reasonable proposition to put to us that somehow, Ethical somehow, plenty, somehow, right? certain lives don't matter. All well, that's what I'm matter. hearing, well, and that that's what people at home are hearing. That is hearing. not what I am saying. Okay. That is not what, what I'm saying. What people at home uh, looking at is the time, and <laughs> I'm afraid we're out of it. Um, that's all we have time for. Please thank our panel Scott Ryan, Diana Sayed, Hugh White, Penny Wong, and Tom Switzer.